Come away, O human child, to the waters and the wild, with a fairy hand in hand, for the world's more full of weeping than you can understand. On the night of October 27th, 2004, several residents on E Road in B called the local police station to report a disturbance at the home of one of their neighbours. The reports indicated that a possible home invasion was in progress, as a number of people in dark clothing had been seen moving furtively around the property at, later determined to be the residence of one Alice L a single female in her mid-twenties who lived alone. Some callers reported raised voices, which were taken to be indicative of a confrontation between the homeowner and a possible assailant. Officers arrived on the scene at 23.23 hours, approximately two minutes after a 911 call indicated that a young woman was seen confronting one or more possible intruders at her front door. However, The caller could not give further information due to a sudden surge in the local electrical grid which shut down the power for the entire neighborhood. When the responding officers searched the residence, the front door was ajar and there was no sign of Alice L. Investigators noted that there was no sign of forced entry or struggle inside the house. The subject's possessions were all intact, including valuable electronic equipment, and a set of car keys left in plain view. The vehicle they matched was still in the driveway. The only evidence at the scene was a partial set of footprints in the gravel walk which led around to the rear of the house, and these were discarded on the grounds that they were too small to belong to an adult. It is believed that they were made by one or more of the neighborhood children, although investigators have not been able to determine which child in particular, nor when the footprints were made. The following missive was found by police during the subsequent investigation. The pages were scattered on the floor of the living room. It is believed that they were originally stacked on a table in the foyer and were blown off by a breeze from the front door or disturbed by the entry of officers H and N. It is believed that the subject wrote an account of certain odd goings-on in the days and possibly minutes leading up to her disappearance. Investigation into the matter is ongoing, though the case officially went cold in the spring of 2010, and no new leads have been generated in quite some time. As of this writing, no trace of Alice L. has ever been found. The written document found at the scene remains the best and only insight into the subject's life immediately before she went missing. I'm not sure who's going to be reading this. I'm not even sure who would believe me if they did. But I have to get it down on paper. I have to. Somehow, it's not quite real when I try to put things together in my head. But with writing, it becomes clearer. In any case, by the time anyone reads this, I doubt I'll be around to listen to their criticisms. I doubt I'd care even if I did hear it. Because there are lots of stories in this world, real and imagined. And this one, well, this one is mine. I've never been a big fan of other people. Even when I was a child myself, I felt out of phase somehow. My classmates seemed to shun me, not out of any particular malice, but simply in the way that a round hole shuns a square peg. Of course, the fact that my family moved just about every other year for most of my life didn't help matters much. It started when I was in grade school, and there never seemed to be any reason for it. My folks didn't have military contracts or job transfers. I'd just come home and find another for sale sign on the front lawn. I spent so much time feeling disconnected from the people around me that it started to feel normal by the time I was in my twenties. 
Living alone wasn't so much a choice as a necessity. I didn't have any close friends. I had no siblings. And since my teens, I had been getting a strong impression that my parents really wanted me to leave. That impression waned somewhat when they helped me lease a small house of my own for my 23rd birthday, but solidified again later. Overhearing a conversation expressing relief at your forthcoming absence will do that. Nothing like hearing your own parents say that they can't wait until their own kid is out of their hair for good. So, that's how I wound up in this two-bedroom rancher. I have a job with one of those big software companies. So the second bedroom is my office. And that's where I spend most of my time. A lot of the clients were overseas. So my hours are pretty scattered. And often extend into the small hours of the morning doesn't leave much time for a social life. I don't mind it much, though. Computers are nice and predictable. Very few problems that can't be solved with a new patch or a look at the instruction manual. People are complicated. They don't come with instructions. They lie. They laugh at you. They kick you when you're down. Yes, it's people you have to look out for. It was on one of those late nights that all of this started. I'd just taken a break from a template redesign and was walking out to the kitchen for a snack when movement out of the front window caught my eye. I went over for a closer look. There was a kid standing in my driveway. I couldn't tell if it was a boy or a girl through the gloom, but it looked like they were wearing a hooded sweatshirt. I figured it was just one of the neighbor's kids, sneaking out. I didn't know anyone on my street by name, so I couldn't have told you whose kid it might have been. In any case, it was none of my business, so I got my snack and went back to work. About ten minutes later, somebody knocked at my door. Now, sometimes I order a pizza or takeaway tie when I can't get away to cook something, but on this particular night, I hadn't. Grumbling at the interruption, I went to answer. If it was that kid from earlier, I was going to be pissed. Sure enough, I could see the same kid through the window, standing on my front step. I went to open the door, ready to tell the kid to go the hell home. But then I stopped. Something felt... wrong. My eyes were glued to the silhouette behind the frosted glass. My hand frozen on the door handle. A strange, cold feeling crept into my stomach. Like I'd swallowed a lump of ice. For one split second, my entire being was filled with an overwhelming certainty that if I opened that door, something awful was going to happen. The figure outside raised a hand and knocked again. I nearly jumped out of my skin, and then had to laugh at myself for being such a candy ass. I'd handled living alone just fine, and I could damn sure handle one annoying little ding-dong ditcher, even if the kid was planning to try some stupid prank. Leaving the security chain latched, I opened the door just enough to peer out at my visitor. The porch light cast the kid's face in shadow but I thought I saw short hair and boyish features underneath. I couldn't decipher an exact age. An educated guess might have been somewhere in that indeterminate period between 11 and 13. His jeans were dirty. Likewise, the battered sneakers on his feet. The red hoodie looked oddly damp. Had it been raining? I couldn't recall hearing rain on the roof. More importantly, what was the kid doing walking around at this time of night? Hey, I said, proud that my voice sounded firm and confident. No trace of a wall. You need help, kid? Can I come in? The question sounded rehearsed, like the kid was reading from some hidden script. He made no move to raise his head, and I still couldn't get a good look at his face. Um, excuse me? Can I come in? Are you lost? 
Do you need me to call your parents or something? I need to call my parents. Let me in. That chill rippled up my spine again. Something had sounded off that time. Not just like the lines were rehearsed, but as though the kid were using a stage voice and it had just slipped. Something was underneath that childish tone. I couldn't put my finger on it, but it was nothing good. The security chain suddenly looked a whole lot less secure. Listen, I said. If you want me to call somebody, I'll do that. Are you in trouble? Do you want me to call the cops? Silence for a moment. Then the kid raised a fist and banged on the door again. The sound echoed like cannon fire. The blow vibrated the whole frame, making the glass panes rattle. Hey, what the f- Let me in. There was no mistaking the menace now. There was such malice behind that voice. Such anger. More snarl than speech. And a strange undertone like the screech of tearing metal. That was not a child's voice. There was just no way. Another blow struck the door. I rushed to close it. The kid was looking straight at me through the gap under the security chain. I could see his face now, and it made that sick, chilly feeling creep into my gut again. His skin was white. Whiter than salt. Whiter than cracked ice. Whiter than snow. White like paste or paper with a too perfect finish. Like someone had sculpted it, fired it, and sanded it smooth. A facsimile of a child's face. A life-sized doll. But the eyes. Oh, they were the worst. Pitch black. Pools of lifeless ink. Horrible in contrast to the porcelain skin. The porch light made stars of half-consumed light in their depth but only just barely. The child thing smiled, and one thin hand reached toward the gap in the door, toward the increasingly flimsy-looking chain, the only thing between me and this thing from the pit. I threw myself against the door. The kid jumped back to avoid losing a finger as it slammed shut. I threw the deadbolt and leaned against it, waiting for another blow. It never came. After a few seconds, I heard footsteps on gravel and realized with a terrified jolt that the kid, the thing, was moving around the side of the house. I dashed for the back door and bolted that too. Barely seconds later, the knob began to rattle. Unlike the front door, this one had no glass panes, only a peephole. For once, I was grateful for that. The footsteps circled the house for the next several hours. I closed all the blinds so no one could see in and huddled on the couch in that living room, baseball bat in hand, staring at the front door. At any second, I expected to hear another knock or the sound of breaking glass from one of the other rooms. The thought of calling the cops, as I'd threatened to do earlier, did cross my mind. But what could I tell them? 911, what is your emergency? Um, yeah. I'm trapped in my house and there's a creepy looking kid walking around outside. At best, they'd laugh at me. At worst, I could be fine for a prank calling emergency services. Either way, they wouldn't send help. No. I was on my own. Story of my life. Around 5 a.m., I realized that I hadn't heard the footsteps in a while. I risked a peek through the blinds in several rooms. It showed that kid thing had vanished. I hadn't heard it leave. It was just gone, as if some distant timer had dinged and the lurker had vanished with a snap of its chalk white fingers. I went through the rest of the day in a bit of a daze, trying to wrap my head around the night's events. Was it 
some sort of elaborate prank. Something involving sclera contacts and voice modulators. Had I had some bad takeaway and just dreamed the whole thing? Was I finally losing it after too many late nights spent staring at a computer screen? Well, I tried to work, even though it was my day off. That was my usual go-to when I didn't know what else to do with myself. Work and more work. It felt safer outdoors while the sun was up, but when the afternoon started to wane, I still made sure all the doors and windows were locked. I finished early, so I made myself some dinner and settled in to watch a movie. A little bit of paranoia kept me glancing at the front door, but all was still. By 1am, I had almost managed to convince myself that I had imagined the whole thing that there was no creepy kid, that I should just pack it in and get some much-needed sleep. And then... I didn't want to look, but somehow I had to. I crept to the front door, and sure enough, there was that kid-sized silhouette behind the frosted glass, one arm raised. Let us in. That same inhuman tone. That same underlying snarl. It wasn't even bothering to pretend. I wasn't dreaming. I wasn't dreaming and I wasn't crazy. This was happening. We know you're there. Let us in. Wait. Us? What did it mean? Us? The back door. A second set of knocks on the back door. My heart thumped so hard it almost choked me. There were two of them. Go away! I yelled. Go the hell away and leave me alone. I'm calling the cops. Let us in. Get lost! I grabbed my bat again, glad I'd locked up well before dark. I went to find my cell phone. The hell with being laughed at, and the hell with fines. I was calling the cops. One weird little kid playing a prank could be ignored, but two of them, working together, two nights in a row. No, that couldn't be ignored. I flicked over to the dial pad and was about to tap in the emergency number when I heard it. Not on the door this time. God help me. It wasn't the door. It was my bedroom window. Heart hammering against my ribs, I turned. And there, standing just outside the window, not even three feet away, was a little girl. I could only see her outstretched hand in the top of her head, but that was enough. Her nose was level with the sill, and a pair of dead black eyes were looking straight in at me. The tiny hand that reached up to wrap against the glass was corpse white. The tiny fingernails were an odd shade of bluish grey as if the blood that flowed beneath was something other than crimson. I heard her little voice through the window, tinny and nasal, overlaid with a rising yowl like an angry cat. Let us in! I yanked the blinds down and dashed across the hall into my office. The window pane there was mercifully empty for the moment. I wasted no time in drawing the blinds there, too. I pulled the tall bookcase in front of the window for good measure. The knocking continued for hours, as did the footsteps circling around the house. A few times they knocked on the window on the other side of the bookcase, but I stayed quiet, crouched inside the closet, waiting for the sun to come up. 
The next night, they came back. And the next, and the next. With each visit, their numbers grew, until it sounded like there was a small hand knocking on every square inch of the walls and windows. A bevy of screeching whispers followed my every step and filled my dreams with a never-ending chorus of Let's us in. I stopped sleeping. I barely made it through my work days. I only ever left the house in the broadest daylight. I always searched each room thoroughly when I returned half dreading that one of the little monsters would somehow get in and be crouched under my bed or behind a door, waiting for me. What could I do? The house was all I had. My parents weren't going to take me in. I didn't have any friends to call, nor did I have the money for a hotel. Moving was out of the question, and anyway, it wouldn't happen fast enough to help me. I was on my own. I covered my windows with newspaper to block out the sight of those small shapes darting by. I couldn't tell exactly where they were, but at least they couldn't see me either. The baseball bat was never out of my reach, not for one second. I didn't know how much good it would do against these, these things, but if they were determined to get to me, then I was just as determined to go down swinging. On the seventh night, as I huddled in my office closet with bat in hand, I heard the voice of the boy thing from the very first night, right outside the window. Alice! I nearly had a heart attack. I know you can hear me, Alice. Let us in. Get Ben, you little creep, I muttered under my breath. We have so much to tell you, Alice. There is so much you need to know. Let us in, Alice. Adrenaline and anger flooded my veins, driving away the fear for a few blissful seconds. I thumped the bat hard against the wall, as if it could magically pass through and smack the creeper in his pasty china doll face. Go away! I screamed at the top of my lungs, not caring how hysterical it sounded. Get the hell off my property before I come out there and beat your rotten heads in. Oh, you won't do that, Alice. Crap. Since when was calling my bluff part of the plan? Oh, we know you, Alice. You're ours. You've always been ours, and we know you so very very well. Just let us in. That scared me more than anything. This wasn't random. These things hadn't just decided to torment someone they'd happened to discover living alone on a dead-end street. No, they knew my name. They were looking for me, trying not to hyperventilate. I put my fingers in my ears, curled into a ball on my closet floor, and stared at the bookcase covering the window until the feeble light of dawn glimmered around the edges of the dark wood. That day, I blew off work entirely and dove head first into the internet, looking for information. A lot of wild theories circulated about weird creatures that looked like black-eyed kids who'd knocked on people's doors. Some sites said they were demons. Others insisted they were aliens. Still others had wild theories about the spirits of murdered children. I was at a loss. There was too much speculation, and not enough hard evidence for me to draw any sort of conclusion. The only thing the various sites agreed upon was that the only defense against these black-eyed kids was to lock your doors and windows and refuse to let them in. Not one mentioned what to do if they came to your house more than two nights in a row. Three more nights passed. More knocking. More voices. More pleas for entry. I was in agony, 
I couldn't eat, couldn't sleep, couldn't even think. The whispers were echoing in my head in the daytime by that point. I tried to block the sounds out with noise-cancelling headphones, but the voices seemed to be inside my thoughts as well as outside my home, like a thousand tiny fingers tapping on the windows of my mind. The bat had ceased to be a comfort. Nothing felt safe. When the sun went down tonight, I knew they would come. Knew it long before the knocking began. Before the voices leaked through the windows. Before the whispers swelled into a scream and my own ragged cries joined the cacophony. Alice, Alice, let us in. Let us in. Sobbing, I bolted from the closet and made for the front door. I don't know what madness drove me. I wasn't feeling brave or heroic, or even angry anymore. I just wanted it to stop. I ripped the newspaper off the window beside the door and flicked on the porch light. I froze. I felt my heart give a terrified, irregular jerk against my ribs, as if it too wanted to escape the sight. There weren't just a few of them now, not even a dozen. There had to be close to fifty, maybe more, all in those damp red hoodies, all standing stock still with those soulless eyes fixed on the house. Hell's own child choir. A congregation of black eyes and whispering mouths, through whose pale lips I imagined a faintly glimpsed jagged, sore blade teeth. I could hear them through the door. We know you, Alice. You belong with us. Let us in. Let us in. Shut up. I banged my fist against the glass. Shut up, you creepy little bastards. I'm not letting you in. Go away and leave me alone, damn it. The whispers stopped. The silence that followed was almost louder than the voices had been. They seemed to withdraw from the front porch ever so slightly. I didn't see them exactly move. They were just on the step one second, and then I blinked, and they were several feet further back on the walkway. Another blink, and that familiar face was inches away on the other side of the glass. He seemed to have gotten taller somehow since that first night, as if my fear was some sort of growth stimulant. Our eyes were almost level with each other, and I stared into that pitiless darkness. Terrified that, if I blinked again, I'd suddenly find him beside me, inside the house. Deep in those hollow voids, I thought I saw faint sparks, the colour of rotten limes. Alice. Up close, his mouth looked like the maw of some primordial beast. Too large for his face and full of teeth that sprouted like shards of broken glass from pale, greenish gums. He smiled at me, and the grin stretched halfway around his head. It's been a long time. A long time? What the hell did he mean by that? Was this all some sort of sick joke to them? I haven't seen you since you were very small. You've grown, Alice. Grown out of your pigtails and into your very own house. Our little girl lost. All grown up now. What the hell are you talking about? You're ours, Alice. We lost you when you were very small. But now, we've found you again. Lost me. I was falling into the bottomless pit behind those eyes. Something was nagging at the back of my mind, like pieces of a puzzle that don't quite fit, trying to put themselves together. 
Your parents asked for you, Alice, and begged for you. They brought sweets to the toadstool ring, and soft, dead things to the old oak. They pleaded and cried, told us their child was dead, asked us to give them another. So we gave them you. The world seemed to fall away beneath my feet. This couldn't be real. My parents were my parents. My mother had carried me, given birth to me. How many times had they told me this story of how my father had nearly fainted in the delivery room? They recounted it every year on my birthday, and they laughed. I had a birth certificate with their names on it. I was their child wasn't I. But our children are not like human children. The thing outside the door continued. They look like human children. Walk and talk and breathe and eat and cry the same. But there is always something just a little off. The mortal ones, they can't explain it. Can't even put words or reason to it. When they feel it, Alice, they feel the strange in you. Haven't you ever wondered why the world seemed to hold you at arm's length? Why no one wanted to get close to you? Why even your parents never seemed sure of you? I'd never even given it a second thought. I'd always assumed that other children just didn't like the new kid who just arrived at school. Or the weird kid playing at the edge of the playground. I'd always assumed that my parents hadn't wanted children. Or maybe that I wasn't the kind of kid that they'd wanted. But, looking back, everyone I'd ever met had given me the same look. Cautiously friendly at first, and then inexplicably wary. Uneasy. Like I was some wild thing that might bite if provoked. Your parents did not honor the bargain, Alice. You were only meant to be theirs for a short while before you came home, as all our children do. We tried to find you, Alice, for so very long we tried. But you just kept moving, hopscotching from one town to the next. Whenever we came calling, they'd pack up and run. And then you grew up, and they sent you away. All those unexplained changes of address. The strained looks on my parents' faces when I'd ask why I had to change schools yet again. The silence of clenched jaws on an early morning car ride I could only just barely recall. Why had we moved so much? I felt a few more puzzle pieces slide into place. A picture was beginning to emerge. The grin was softening now. It looked almost friendly. But now we've found you, Alice. And we've come to take you home, as we should have done all those years ago. Open the door, Alice. The thing raised one hand and stick thin fingers with tips the same shade as new moss, tapped gently against the glass. Let us in. My throat was drier than a thousand deserts. It seemed to close on itself as I tried to summon the will to choke out the words. Who, what are you? A sea of smiles opened in my yard. Cavernous eyes lit with spring-colored sparks. I almost heard the words before the whispers came. Family. Family. Your family, Alice. We are your family. The tall boy on my porch smiled, and there was something like affection in it. Alice, it's time to come home. I don't know quite how I ended up on the couch, but I know I've been sitting here for a long time writing this all down. Like I said, it makes more sense that way. Makes the pieces fit together in my head. I check the internet too, just once more, 
And there's a word for this sort of thing. For stolen children. Substituted children. You don't see it much outside of the old fairy tales. But it does exist. Changeling. Yeats even wrote a poem about it. Come away, O oh human child, to the waters and the wild, with a fairy hand in hand, for the world's more full of weeping than you can understand. There are so many more like me, people they've lost as children for one reason or another, that they come to retrieve. But if those people have spent too much time away, they don't recognize their family anymore. They just know there's something strange, something off about the kids knocking at their door. And fear makes them run, like I did. I don't know why my parents did what they did, why they asked for me, why they held on for years to a child that they couldn't bring themselves to love, why they didn't just give me back when it became apparent I was too strange, too other for their safe little world. Maybe they wanted to keep trying. Maybe they were desperate. I don't know. It doesn't really matter now. The kids in the red hoodies are still outside. But there's no more knocking. No more whispering. They're just standing there. Like they're waiting for me. These fey, inhuman things. My family. And I think. I think I'm ready to go with them now. Thanks for taking the time to drop by and watch this video. You know what would make me a happy doctor? Hitting that like button, leaving a comment, and subscribing to my channel. Go on, I've got plenty more stories to tell you. <laughs>